when we don't let these players play, we we don't get to see them in games. Yeah. Practice is one thing. Games are another. We, we bring in defenders. We didn't get to see them play. We brought in a 16-year-old midfielder. We didn't get to see her play at all. Like, I don't understand why we're bringing them in to fill out a practice squad. The best combination that I really enjoyed watching in the semifinal match was actually Jenna Nyswanger and Mallory Swanson on that left side. I thought their ability and Nyswanger's ability to step up and feed Swanson because she wasn't getting it through the midfield really helped out this U.S. attack. The U.S. Women's National Team wins their seventh She Believes Cup. Welcome into Straight from the Pitch. Joined as always by Scotty Schweitzer. I'm Anna Witte. We are talking all USWNT today because the NWSL was on an international break. We saw two games from the U.S. Women's National Team. A win over Japan and a win over Canada Tuesday night that came down to penalty kicks. The United States in the second half, they came back. It was a brace from Sophia Smith that got them the lead initially. And then Canada, after a Crystal Dunn foul inside the box, led to a PK for Canada that tied it up, that led it into PKs. But really, the last show on Friday, we spoke about the combinations up top and what we want to see from the attack, especially since Mallory Swanson and Katarina Macario got called back up to the national team. So we saw in the semifinal a start from Swanson, Alex Morgan, and Trinity Rodman. In the final, it was a start from Trinity Rodman, Alex Morgan, and Jaden Shaw. What did you see out of those combinations, and what did you like best from them? Uh, well, up top, I, I wish we would have saw Macario a little bit more because I think when she plays, it's a different dynamic of how we play up top. We don't look to go over the top every time. Um, I think from this tournament, and I think we knew it before, Sophia Smith has to be the nine. If she's on the field, she's a much better nine than she is out on the flanks. Uh, I think as a, as a nation and as a, a country of U.S. women's soccer fans, we have to be happy with where Swanson is. Man, I thought she looked really good in both games and super dangerous, super um, highly intelligent with her, her movements, but also very decisive and very aggressive in her thoughts. Like there was no, there was no counterintuitive of what, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? She she attacked, she attacked, she attacked, she attacked. And she looked fast. She looked quick. She uh, was skillful. All of her movements uh, usually ended up in getting us a chance going forward. I didn't think Morgan played great in the, in the finals. Uh, she did okay in the semis. I think we played better as a team in the semis. I think the team on the field was a better, uh, they had a better understanding of each other and moved the ball a little bit faster than in the, in the finals now granted Canada maybe saw something on film against Japan and they they made adjustments they also seem to have make adjustments in their lineup based on our athleticism to match it and and I think they did a, a pretty good job of that but up top it still just seems like there's not a real good understanding of what each forward runs they make how they do it now granted yesterday when we made our subs we had Swanson in there uh, Trinity Rodman came in and Smith went back up top. And I think we looked a little bit better when that happened. But there was some other changes, I think, that facilitated that to, to look better because we dropped Haran a little bit deeper and almost played her as a 10 behind two sixes in a sense. And, and because of that, she had a little bit more time and space for her passing ability, which then, you know, she finds Shaw, who then finds Rodman, who then finds Smith. And, that, and that's just that ball moving on that second goal was – was something that we should be looking to do throughout the game, not just sporadically. And, and I think that's what we see with us is we do some good things here and there, and then we do a lot of bad things throughout the rest of the game. And, and that's, as a fan, as a, as a coach, that's my problem. If, if we can do it, we have to learn how to do it constantly. But like I said, the movement up top is so predictable that that's where we have our problems when we get into the final third. There's, there's, there's not enough diagonal runs, crisscrossing runs, changing of positions. It's, it's more straight lines and get me the ball and then let me see what I can do as an individual instead of playing as a unit, as a group. You make a great point about Sophia Smith having to be the nine. And I, 
I don't understand why they keep trying to use her in the wide areas when Alex Morgan is on the field. I think we've learned that those two players just can't be on the field at the same time, and that's okay. The best combination that I really enjoyed watching in the semifinal match was actually Jenna Nyswanger and Mallory Swanson on that left side. I thought their ability and Nyswanger's ability to step up and feed Swanson because she wasn't getting it through the midfield really helped out this U.S. attack. And not only Swanson, she can get wide and she can provide those crosses into Jaden Shaw, Alex Morgan um, inside the box. I just really enjoyed watching their partnership. And I don't think they've really played many minutes together. I mean, Swanson hasn't played since last April and Nyswanger at the time was new to the team. So uh, that to me, even though Nyswanger is not in the attack, I think she was a really good facilitator for Swanson up top. You mentioned that Macario only got 10 minutes in the semifinal matchup. Why do you think Kilgore is really just using the six numbers up top that we've seen time and time again, plus Swanson? I have no idea. I, I really don't like we we have these tournaments and, and I listen to the commentators and, and, and stuff and I understand we want to win. We we like trophies. We all, you know, but this is this is these are friendlies. We can right. call it whatever we want. We can come up with a trophy. We can. But it was a friendly like so we're like, oh, more hardware like. Really? Who cares? Is that really hard? Is that really hardware? Like it's it's our own tournament. Like we set it up. It, it's really more of a money maker and an ability for whoever we bring in, not only our teams, Japan, Brazil, Canada, to get some some quality time together, some training, and get some games. But to say like this is this is not the Olympics. The pressure is not the same. This is not a World Cup. This the, the pressure is not the same. So when we bring these players in, especially young players to them being because they're young and they're new to the team and they're trying to fit into a group, there is a different amount of pressure on those players. And that's why I feel it's good to get them in the game so that we can see how they handle that type of pressure, not just the pressure of what's happening on the field. Like with Nicewanger and Swanson, you have, a, you have an outside back that in these two games we should learn that we have an outside back who has the mentality of a center mid as a 10. Right. So she's not just looking to defend. She's also looking to create. And that's why on that side, when she's playing, it's really fun to watch because she presses the field to get higher up the field to play offensive minded. And in doing so, she also covers her defensive responsibilities. She's just doing it in a different way. Whereas in the last two games, and I didn't think she played bad. I didn't think she had a great final, but Fox is doing more of defending instead of more of attacking. So so that side's kind of isolated and, and out on its own. Granted, yesterday in the final, she was with Smith, who kind of does all the attacking on her own. Mm -hmm. Whereas Swanson coming back from an injury, and I think that's just the way Swanson plays anyway, but she'll look to combine with players. And then she'll dribble when it's the right time. Whereas Smith out wide will dribble at any time. She, even if it's three against one against her. She doesn't care. She continues to take too many touches. Granted, she had two goals yesterday. I didn't think she had the greatest match. And there was a play earlier where she should have just shot it lefty and she looked like she tried to cut it inside and then they stole the ball. But we were on a breakaway. We had this little break and here we go. And she also had a pass across to Morgan who did make the correct run and she didn't play that ball. So for me is when we don't let these players play, we, we don't get to see them in games. Yeah. Practice is one thing. Games are another. We we bring in defenders. We didn't get to see them play. We brought in a 16-year-old midfielder. We didn't get to see her play at all. Like, I don't understand why we're bringing them in to fill out a practice squad. Like, bring them in, throw them out there, and let's see what it is so that we don't do it in the Olympics and lose. Like, we know what's coming. We have to know, like, if we, if we bring any of these younger players that we didn't get to see play and throw them out there and they have a bad game, we have no right to blame the player. Yeah. We really don't. We, we're going to have to blame the staff that we didn't do a good enough job in our analyzing of them and seeing them to say, this is they're not ready for the moment. They're not ready right. for, for this opportunity at this time. That doesn't mean they're bad players, but we don't know. We didn't see them. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what they can do on the field. I don't know how they, how they link with other players, how they combine with different players, how they play. At times, it almost seems like 
the old guard has something over the Federation and they keep getting in these games. Listen, I am a huge Haran fan, massive Haran fan. But there are times with when we have the younger talent on the field, I think Haran is a deterrent on the field. She plays a slower brand of soccer. She slows the pace down. And that's very good on certain teams, especially when you get the train day in and day out with them. But like she did much better yesterday when she went to the six than she was doing anything at the 10. She was almost in the way for a lot of the game uh, higher up the pitch because they were man marking her. They always knew, let's find out where her hand is. Like I said, she's a great player. You have to game plan for her. But the last couple games, she hasn't been what the team needed because we've been playing a lot faster pace. The younger players get the ball off their foot a lot faster. Um, I think it's Pep Guardiola saying, the, fast, the, the faster I pass it, the faster it comes back. Well, Haran takes extra touches on the ball and keeps the ball, but then that slows down the runs. There was a play yesterday where she got the ball and she took extra touches and she wanted Jaden Shaw to continue her run through, but Shaw had to stop, otherwise she would have been off sides. And then Haran played it, it went through, the goalie picked it up, Sheridan picked it up, and then we we moved on with it. But Haran yelled at Shaw, and like I'm watching the game saying she had to stop because on your third touch, she was off sides. So you should have got it, trap it, play it, get it done. And I think that's kind of some of the opportunities we miss because we're afraid to throw some of these younger players out there without the old guard being out there. And that I'm not saying anyone on our team, listen, they're they're all really good players, but T- times change and, and things have to move on. And we, and it's, and I almost sometimes think maybe that's why they brought in Emma Hayes. Cause she's going to have to cut a whole bunch of veterans, no matter what going into the Olympics, just because of the way the roster sizes are made up. Yeah. Emma Hayes is set to join the U S team next month. So we're right on top of her joining this squad. And I think you make a great point with Haran dropping deeper that forced or they moved Jaden Shaw into that 10 role. That's what set up that Trinity Rodman assist to Sophia Smith. It was that really quick play. But then again, it goes into that double pivot conversation where why the U.S. team, do they need a double pivot? No, we're supposed to be this fast athletic side. So in the midfield is that you know, was that a missed opportunity to put on new players? And two of those new players that joined this squad that, you know, we were really excited to see in Lily Johannes and Eva Gatino. I mean, they have a lot of promising attributes to their game. Gatino, she didn't she didn't join the NWSL draft and said she decided to go and play at PSG. She's been a player that she's played six club games for them. They've seen that she can withhold her own. So in that opportunity with Naomi Gurma going out in the semifinal match with a, a minor injury, they subbed on Dahl Kemper to play with Davidson instead of putting in Gatino. And then I was like, you know, that's okay. Why not? In in this game in particular, it was something that they didn't expect to have to do. Maybe that wasn't a situation for a new player to jump into. But in the second match, you start Davidson over Gatino. I am a Davidson fan. I think she's a great player and, and she's a solid center back. But it's not about that in these games because who cares if you win or lose heading into the Olympics? You want to see what you have. And to your point, it was a missed opportunity for Gatino. There was missed opportunities in the midfield to put on Johannes, maybe take out Emily Sonnet, Haran, whatever position she plays in the midfield. I just think, you know, we head to the Olympics. God forbid something happens to an important player. What do you know about these new players that you might or might not take to the Olympics? And especially, with, as we mentioned before we joined the show, only 18 players get to go to the Olympics. So in that situation, you really only have such a small pool to grab from if somebody goes down. Yeah, I agree. The, the Gatino one for me in the back, when Germa goes down, I'm okay with her not coming into that game. Yeah. We haven't been able to talk to a young player. We haven't been able to get situations understood. But then we know she's hurt. We know she's hurt after the game, the first game. Now you have a couple days to prepare this player and say, look, you're starting. What do we need to do to help you? Whether that's um, something during a training, uh, that's food, whatever, just to get her mentally ready to play. And then giving her all the information of how we're going to play, where players are going to be. Let the players know 
Okay, you're going to be connected to her, talk to her. You're a veteran player. Let's have some words with her. Keep her calm. Let's keep it going. You know who you're going to have in goal. Have your goalies talk to her. So now she's had a couple days to prepare herself. She's ready. She knows who the opponent is. She knows she's playing against Canada. She knows what Canada brings. Granted, I think they would have been a little thrown off, and they probably were with Haitama playing out wide instead of centralized, which I think kind of threw them for a little bit of a loop because Haitama almost played it like a false nine wide. So it was like it was hard to understand where she was going to be. But I, I totally agree. Like you had a couple days to prepare this player to be ready. This is a back. So usually backs aren't getting subbed in and subbed out throughout the game. They usually let's keep our back for as long as no one's getting destroyed. Mm -hmm. Let's let's keep let's keep it organized and the same throughout the game. Don't mess with the back line. Whereas midfielders, they know they're coming off the bench. They know they're getting subbed out. It's, it's That's part of the game in the midfield because they're asked to carry such a, a heavy load in the fitness part of it, the running and the, the movements and then the tackling and the defending, that they know they're probably going to get subbed out. So for Johannes not to get in a game, like that one didn't make any sense to me unless it was saying, look at us, we brought a 16-year-old to our camp. Yay for us. Like we were trying to grab headlines or something. Throw her out there. Let's just see what it looks like. Let's see, is it the time now or is the time for the future? I, we don't know. Like, if we didn't throw Jaden Shaw out there, we wouldn't have been able to see her score five goals in five straight starts and then, yeah. you know, not get her goal last night. But she's or an still, ice longer, like uh, what she's been able to do. Yeah, like that's what I mean. Like, we have these players. Let's throw them out there. And then it's turning out to be like, as I watch, man, these younger players have a very similar brand of soccer that is very effective in the world today, mm -hmm. whereas some of our older players are having a hard time leaving a brand of soccer that was very good for us in the past. And the game has changed and, and, and the style of plays are different and we have to adapt and move on. And we, we have the players that can do that. I'm not saying get rid of all of the old players and the old guard. We need them. We need them to set the culture and, and to show us what we need to do and, and hold us to higher standards. Yes, but on the field, we we have players that need to get out there. And listen, I, I know it's a tough decision and nobody wants to hurt anyone's feelings, but make a decision. Morgan right. or Smith. <laughs> I mean, if that's who you chose to play, like you can't play them both. I'm sorry. It just doesn't look good. It doesn't flow. It doesn't work. It, we, we didn't start really getting goals until the second half. And I understand, I think Morgan was still in for the first one, but it was a much different game when Morgan came out. And that's not saying that's Morgan's fault. Morgan maybe would have stayed in and Smith could have came out and we would have had a different look on the outside with Rodman. And maybe that would have worked. But the, the two of them together, I think it's been proven that it does not work. From the, from the World Cup to the last couple games that they've played together in friendlies. It's just proving that we can't have two nines on the field and one not playing the nine. It's a really good step to bring in these new young players and let them get minutes in training and, and get to know the team. But it's the next step that we need is these minutes. And there's a few more international windows, not many. I mean, we have to see Gatino, Johannes, if you're going to bring them in, make such a big deal, make this such a big moment for these young players. We have to see them on the pitch. Goalkeeper, it's the same situation as well. And not to knock Alyssa Nair because she was outstanding Tuesday night. She had three PK saves, made a PK of her own. She's a phenomenal goalkeeper with great leadership skills. But should Kilgore and Hayes be evaluating Murphy and Campbell in case something does happen to Nair? 100%. The, the, the goal for Canada, the goal for Canada, um, not the penalty kick, the goal in the run of play. You know, that's easily a broken leg for either one of those two players. Oh, for wait. Nair or the that's when the player was dribbling and she kind of stepped out. Pushed it a little bit too second. far. Nair came out, cleared it, cleared it into her, mm -hmm. deflected back, went to Rose, who played it across, to Leon, who put it through Dahl Kemper's legs. But there's a goalie coming out. And, and we having possession, a lot of times we play high up the field. And if Gurma's not playing, there's a chance for a breakaway because of the space in behind, which means your goalie's going to have to come out and confront the, the dribbler, which she did. But let's say she gets hurt. Now what? Now, which one of those two goalies is your player that comes in? Which We don't know because we never see anybody but Nair. Like, okay, that's what I'm saying. We know what Nair brings to the table. She's your starter. Good, great. She doesn't have to start in the She Believes Cup game final. 
She really doesn't. Let's see what Campbell can do. She was the goalkeeper of the year in the same league that Nair played in. Granted, different team, but she's in Houston and Nair's in Chicago and both teams were terrible last year. So either one of them could have been goalkeeper of the year. In a sense, they're getting enough shots on them. So my thing is, why are we bringing in goalies and we only always see one? Again, it seems like we bring in players for training. Oh, great. We have three goalies so we can have two goals and we can shoot on both goals and one goalie can go back and forth every once in a while and switch to the other goalie and give him a rest. Oh, and great. We got a 16 year old and a girl playing at PSG, but they're really here just to make sure that our numbers are good for practice. No, like we brought them in. Let's play them. Let's, let's see what they can do. Let's see if they change the dynamic of what's going on on the field. I, I don't understand what some of the ways we do things. Um, what's her face? Albert had been playing, it looked like she was our new savior in the midfield. She had been playing every minute. She had been logging all these minutes and then a little bit of controversy. And now we don't see her really. She gets subbed in a little bit and then she gets subbed in the other day, yesterday. And when she subs in, we move Haran to the six and then she plays the 10, which she hadn't played the whole time prior. So like... Why would we? Why wouldn't we just leave Haran at the ten and move her back in and play the double pivot? And again, I'm going to say it: I am not a fan of the double pivot. I, I don't like it. I think it it basically marks yourself. It gets you get players in your own way. I think I thought Coffee did okay, not her best, but it's hard because Sana is taking up a lot of the same spaces that yeah. she wants to be in. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have these players, and I think that's what was helping with Albert when she was playing. She plays kind of a withdrawn 10, so she plays that eight role pretty well. So our triangle is offset in the midfield, but it's not sitting flat six and six, which we do with Sonnet and, and Coffee. And it almost looked when I saw the lineup, I was like, really, we're trying not to lose instead of trying to win. That, that's what the game looked like to me. And I think the double pivot worked good at the World Cup. Because we were just basically fed up and yeah. we knew what was coming. So we, we kind of pressed the game. So we were just higher up the field with two sixes, but really they were two eights because they were so pressed high up the field because we had had such a bad World Cup that we were just kind of like through frustration, we started to attack the game better at the World Cup. So for me, the double pivot, I, I just, I understand why you use it and I understand when you use it. Like the other day, Arsenal used it against Man City. Yeah, because Man City's better. Like, I don't think the U.S. should be walking into games thinking any team is better than us. Or that, 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 that we have to change the way we play in order to get a result. We have to do better at what we do to get the result. And, and I think that's the problem right now for the U.S. is we are not playing a good enough brand of soccer to get results based on our own play, in a sense. And, and, I, and we can do it. We have these young players play a different brand of soccer of where the soccer – Soccer has gone, has has developed too. I watched Spain play Czechoslovakia the other day, yesterday. It was amazing. Australia did their did their job against Mexico. Like there are some good teams that attack the game, play on the forefront, try to get after teams, and we seem to like hold our ground, hold our ground, play over the top. Hold our ground, hold our ground, play over the top. We we move the ball pretty well until we get to, and I don't even want to say the final third the offensive side of the game. That's when we start to lose our ideas. But knocking the ball out of the back, man, we knocked the ball around good. Coffee was good keeping the ball in possession and moving it side to side, which is the sixes job. And then she has the ability to then break the lines at times too. But it's super hard when you have two sixes out there and Sonnet usually plays the safest possible ball she can possibly play. And I think, too, that with Sonnet and Coffee playing in the midfield together, that's a combination that they've never really played many minutes in that double pivot together before. So if you're going to put in a new situation, might as well put in those new players. The U.S. is on a great track bringing in these new players. Now it's that next step with action. And hopefully with Emma Hayes, there's three games coming up. U.S., play South Korea on June 1st, they play them again on June 4th, and then Mexico on July 13th, which will be a really fun match to watch. And those three games, we just need to see 
really uh, that level and the attack be better. We need to see better combinations. And I just think I really want to see what Johannes and Gatino have to bring, even if they're not the best, even if they, they aren't a good fit for this national team right now, at least we learned something that you never, you never make mistakes in life. You always learn something. And in these moments where there's not a high pressure to win a she believes cup, why not? I don't know. I think that's something, Scotty, you and I will just never figure out. But that's okay. That is okay. At least we get to chat about it here on Straight from the Pitch. One thing we also learned last night about the United States and their Olympics push, they'll have Germany, Zambia, and Australia in their group starting on July 25th, Germany, Australia, Zambia. What do you, I think there's always going to be good groups in the Olympics because it's such a smaller pool than the World Cup. How do you think the United States needs to attack, especially a team like Germany and, and Australia? Yeah, I, I think the good thing is that Germany and Australia play a similar brand of soccer. So for the staff, for the team, you can really go about your business kind of like your game planning isn't a big change. So like if you watched World Cups, um, especially on the men's side and even on the women, you have such the very first game isn't a good sign of what's going to happen in the tournament from each team because they've been game planning for months on end for the very first game. And then once the first game's through, even though they know who their second game in and their third game is against, they haven't game planned. So now you only have a week, four days, three days, whatever you have in between to game plan for the next game. Well, for us, listen, I'm not saying Zambia is terrible, but if we can't beat Zambia, then that's a problem in itself. And we don't deserve to get out of our group. Yeah. So when we game plan, we can game plan basically the same type of style of play to play Australia and to play against Germany, which then hopefully we get those two results plus the Zambia result and come out of our group on top. I think that's the one good thing when we look at who's in our group. The bad thing is we have Australia and Germany in our group who are real quality teams. And I would think Australia riding a high from the world cup has been playing good for over a year, uh, a good brand of soccer and Germany is in the same kind of a boat that we're in where they underachieved at the world cup. So mm -hmm. now they have to go out and prove to their fans, to themselves, to their federation that they still are the team that we all thought they were two years ago and had been playing like they were. So I think that's, that's the big problem with our group is there's two really high quality teams. And then there Zambia is not a terrible team, but the other, the other two are the class of the group plus us. And I, I think that's the one good thing is that we can game plan pretty similar kind of styles of play to play against Australia and Germany. The bad thing is if we don't show up with our a game, those two teams are going to punish us. Right. And right. have the ability to punish us. I should say. Definitely. And that's what the United States learned in the World Cup. And hopefully that World Cup situation last summer is a learning moment and that they know that they have to step into this group in the Olympics at the top of their game. And hopefully they have that confidence with Emma Hayes. I think they will um, because you know, and that's no slight of Vlako Andonofsky at all. I think Emma Hayes just brings a different presence and brings that confidence with her. And hopefully they can figure some pieces out. Other news that's happening around the soccer world. U.S. soccer broke ground on their new national training center in Georgia this week. So that was fun to see just some of the renderings and what's happening on that side of things. Scotty, for you, any other stories that you saw on the international break on the NWSL side this weekend. I know MLS was playing. Charlotte absolutely pff, went on the road and lost to New England, who's at the bottom of the standings. That's just embarrassing. But anything else from MLS or, or soccer before we wrap things up this week? Actually, not not really. But I always I'm a soccer guy, so I always bring everything back to soccer in in a sense. And and this is just something that I look at as a, as as a coach. But I listened to all the interviews with Danny Hurley and Dawn Staley after they were now oh, they're the champions the and basketball championship it was all the basketball and they, and they yeah. interviewed the, the coaches and they asked them both the same question. I don't think it was the same reporter, but they asked Dawn Staley, when you're recruiting, what do you look for? And she said, we make sure they respect their parents. Ooh. If they respect their parents, they're going to respect us as coaches. And now we can help teach. And then they went to Danny Hurley and he said, we don't really recruit the player. 
we recruit the parent. That's who we're talking to. He said they tell on themselves all the time. So if they're asking questions like, did you see the game when we were there recruiting and it was the coach's fault why we lost, blah, blah, blah. And if they're saying, well, what are you going to do for my son to make him get to the NBA? He doesn't recruit him. If it's not team first, they don't recruit the player. It, they, they recruit based on character, not based on they, – they both said we have passed on some an unbelievable athletes, unbelievable talent, unbelievable players with these super high ceilings. But we don't think they're going to achieve it because we don't think they're team-oriented, and that's what we are, and that's the sport we play. And when we have a team and a great locker room, we get results and we win, have a winning culture. And I think that's like when I look around the, the landscape of soccer, especially at the youth level, which is what is helping create these great players, is we keep taking and doing all of our recruiting based on talent. And a lot of it has to do based on character. You can show me some talented players that have bad character, and I'll show you a player that's not going to make and, and not reach their full potential. Show me a weaker player with unbelievable character, and they're going to get further in the game than any of the other players could. And I, I think that was really cool telling points. And like when I watch the national team, and I've said it before, Kennedy Fuller, Jaden Shaw coming from the same club, that's the thing that stood out for me. Not that they're both great players, but their character is great. Who they are as human beings is phenomenal. And, and I think that's what we should be doing as coaches, as, as leaders of the, of the next generations coming up, is we have to coach what goes on on the field, but we also have to coach the character of the game and what's important and what needs to be done. And I know we don't really want to touch on it because everybody has their own opinion, but like the girl, Albert, she was starting and doing wonders for us in the midfield. And all of a sudden she makes a little mistake on social media. And, and now we don't even see her play the first game in the semifinals. They like, they tried to sub her in through an injury. Like, so it was quiet and like, like she made a mistake. She has to grow and learn from it. That's, that's all part of life. But like to then like punish her, like, the way that's what it seems like to me that they're punishing her for a belief or a thought she had or something she did on social media. And to me is like, let's help her learn. Let's help her grow because if it's not done that way, it's really, it's a hard environment to then succeed in when you feel like everybody's against you. That that's just, that's something I took from just listening to these two great coaches at two great schools at two with two great programs and, and I think that's that's part of the problem is we take these players with talent that who think too highly of themselves and don't have the right attitude to be in a team sport environment. And then we, we keep pushing them forward and pushing them forward until a point comes where it's not helpful for anybody. I will say I'm not a huge Dan Hurley fan at all. Uh, not just <laughs> the fact that he beat my Boilermakers Monday night, but also I just – I, why was he pushing and shoving his players on the floor? Like, what are we doing? I don't know. Not a fan uh, of him. But I agree with what you said um, when it comes to having the respect for the parent and him going about the character out. I I think you can say that not just in soccer, but just in life. You're going to get hard workers out of people who respect their peers and are are willing to work hard and maybe don't have the initial talent because you, because you can always coach that if someone's coachable, then you can always get them to the level that you want them to play at, but you cannot, you cannot coach standard. And if your team has a standard and a player comes in and they don't fit that mold when it comes to the, the character standard, they're, they're not going to fit your team, even if they're an absolute goat, like Messi, in, in my opinion, and if they do, it's going to be an awkward, really like clunky situation for the team and the, and the peers on the team. So love that a lot of good basketball this weekend on top of the U S national team. We've got NWSL back in action this weekend, some good ones. I'm really excited about that Portland, North Carolina game. I'm calling the Kansas City um, Gotham game if you're going to be in Kansas City. So that'll be fun to watch as well. Some of those national team players back on their, you know, club roster again. But make sure to follow us on YouTube. You can watch us every single week at SFTP Pod. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, wherever you get your podcast. We will see you next Wednesday. Have a great week.